There is no doubt that the residential school system was used as a means of segregating, assimilating, and ultimately committing genocide against the Indigenous people of Canada. Sadly, these church and government-run schools were only part of the ugly past that has recently been brought to light through the reconciliation process now underway. Prior to the Indian Act of 1951, social services would send abandoned Indigenous children to residential schools. However, the harsh realities of the system were becoming evident, and the practice was no longer acceptable. Hence, the Indian Act of 1951, which gave each individual province the control to enforce child welfare as said province saw fit. In just one decade, the percentage of Indigenous children in provincial care went from 1% to 34% from the beginning of the 50s to the start of the 60s. Unfortunately, the social workers employed to work with the families living on reserve land did not require training in Indigenous affairs and were unaccustomed to the Indigenous ways of parenting. White social workers had Eurocentric expectations that were not met upon arrival to the numerous homes on reserve. Sadly, the Indigenous families were simply living as they had for centuries and were being told that by doing so, they in turn did not love or provide a safe home for their children. Oftentimes, children were taken with no warning or consent, with stories shared of children being scooped from their homes while their parents were out or while the children walked down the street. Many of the children taken were separated from their siblings, forced to leave the province, and in some cases, the country. Their new adoptive mother paraded them on local television. Marlene, Sean, Chris and Eric, Barbara's children. We were just fortunate the first time we went through to be able to get uh, three of one family and uh, three Indians and we, were, we, were, we felt very fortunate. But the happy family image was a facade. Years later, all of the Got children would tell horror stories of abuse. The beatings, the beatings were, uh, it was physical, I mean just anything at hand, any, you know, whatever would hurt the child was done. Eric Gott is currently serving a sentence for manslaughter in a Louisiana penitentiary. For a while I'd become a violent person and I didn't realize it. The last couple of years I've given it a lot of thought. And I think that's where a lot of my problems came from. Being forced to live down here. The scenery, it's like, um, I don't have a concrete memory. It's more like experiencing a past life. At the age of 18, Marlene Gott began a long and difficult journey home to Manitoba. I wanted to be rescued my whole life. I wanted someone to come and get me. I wanted someone to... I wanted the family to come and rescue me and take me back home. After being scooped, the children were typically placed in white homes, with 70% of Indigenous youth being fostered or adopted by non-Aboriginal adults. Given that the 60s scoop lasted well into the 80s, a staggering number of youth were left to be raised by white parents, resulting in a loss of Indigenous heritage and culture. Again, as with residential schools, sexual and physical abuse was systemic and unreported. Many of the adopted children lived outside of both the Indigenous world as they were being raised white, and the Euro-Canadian world as the individuals were Aboriginal. Children were left without an identity or a strong sense of self. There's some rumblings of people knowing a little bit about the 60s scoop, but not in the same way as we may know about residential school as a result of the apology. And I feel that the apology stopped short of acknowledging the aftermath of residential school as they phased them out. Adoption and foster care went through the roof. So by the time I was born, my three older brothers were adopted to three different white homes and one went to Ireland. And so I was lucky that my foster parents insisted that me and my little sister stay together because that wasn't 
the, the policy at the time. It was really about separating the siblings. So I think that at, at, um, like contributing the child and care file to the Bentwood box, when I heard that that was a possibility that we could contribute something, it allowed me to feel that I was contributing to a part of our history that's still silenced because our children are still terribly overrepresented in child welfare. And I'm a visual artist, I'm visual, and I imagine how many trees, because I came from a pulp and paper town, how many trees were taken down to make those files, how much paper was created so those files were possible. But the 60 scoop really took families apart. They, they sent children in different directions. And uh, I gave my, my birth mother a photograph of her surviving children and the ch the, all, our, all our children, her grandchildren at the time. And she was so overcome with emotion, she almost upchucked. She almost vomited. She just we cried so hard because she had never seen her children in the same photograph. And we weren't all there because two had already died. And I just think of how many mothers never seen their children in a photograph. Or even some of the, the testimony we heard here, how many children have never even beholded a picture of their own mother. So how do you grieve something you can't visually see? And so there's so much, uh, and there's so much about the 60 scoop that is, that reunions aren't pretty. There's some children who are begotten by rape or incest. I mean, there's, it's not always easy to reconcile people having to be taken away and, uh, and those reunions can't always be happily ever afters because it didn't have a pretty beginnings to start with. So the 60s scoop is really, it really isn't over because our children, it's been said, are, are more represented in the child welfare system now than ever. And it's really an attack on motherhood. Thanks to reports from the National Indian Brotherhood, statistical data by Patrick Johnson and the Quiet Place report by Justice Edwin Kimmelman, Policy in regards to Aboriginal child welfare began to change in the mid to late 80s. Child apprehension was deemed cultural genocide, thus leading to the province's amendment to allow for children to remain with the family members first before being fostered outside of the core family. Bans have also taken control over their own child welfare and protection services in many cases. Since the 60s scoop, the AFN has filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission based on funding between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities. Likewise, in Ontario, the court has ruled to allow Brown versus Canada to proceed as a court class action suit. Survivors of the 60s scoop are able to sue the government of Ontario for the cultural genocide caused by the 60s scoop and hopefully find reconciliation in the process. Other provinces are expected to follow suit. Although many individuals have found strength through the acts of the 60s scoop, the horrendous wrongdoings of our provincial governments leave many communities in need of further healing and growth. The loss of family connections and the years that would have been shared between children and their parents can never be repaid or regained, which in reality only the Indigenous communities themselves can begin to repair. Oh, yeah.